What's up, America? We are here for another episode of Choir Practice. Instead of our typical whiskey wall environment, we're in a little bit more of an intimate setting this week. Um, we decided that based on some of the incredible guests that we have out here, we would do things in a little bit more of a, a personal situation. And this is the house that we're going to be using for the Wounded Officer Retreat in the second half of the year. So, um, I, I, man, well, I guess you should probably say what's up. Tell them all who you are. Hey, I'm Bernie Hallams, retired law enforcement, 33 years and co-host of this amazing show. And, and now to the guy that uh, I Ooh, can't even, man. Truly, truly an guy. honor. So um, my backstory with, with Troy Anderson here is um, I knew him before he became a trooper. He was just out of the military, and we had a conversation, many conversations, before he became a trooper, and he said to me, I want to become a state trooper. I'm like, all right. And he did. But he didn't just become a state trooper. I'm proud to say he became a guy who was very involved in people's lives and changing their lives and helping get them through some of the toughest times. And we're gonna talk about that today, but super proud of the man he's become and, and very grateful to call him my friend. Thanks, bro. Dude, I got to share steak with you in Vegas. I don't know anything about your backstory other than you, me, and the CEO of the National Law Enforcement Officer Memorial Fund sat there and we dined together and we prayed together and we, we talked about how we can help change lives. And I just, uh, you know, in the most uh, uh, professional way possible, I got to say I love you, man, because your heart, you back. your heart is just in such an incredible place. So before we start, we'd like to open up with a word of prayer. Yeah, lead us. I got this. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for today and thank you for this message that we're about to spread to people. And thank you so much for Troy and all the people, the men and women out there who understand that it was a calling that we did and that stay remained helping law enforcement shelter through their toughest times with love, compassion, and honor. And thank you for this time to have this platform to share with our country. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you, I think one of the biggest mistakes that, that we've made as men over the years that most men make is uh, we're, we're afraid to be vulnerable, right? Like we're afraid to be real. You're supposed to be this big, badass, brave, tough dude who doesn't have any emotion. Um, and what, what I learned um, from attending National Police Week and having attended you know, countless events with the surviving families of officers killed in line of duty, surviving coworkers, um, the, the incredible men and women running organizations like the National Law Enforcement Officer Memorial Fund is that um, our lack of willingness to be vulnerable and to surround ourselves with other men who are willing to check pride and ego um, to be real and to be authentic, it's it's a mistake. And I think that's what has hurt law enforcement over the years is this warrior mindset, which we have to have, right? It's absolutely crucial. But in doing so, we've we've lost the willingness as men to talk about the tough things. Um, and I'm so grateful to the organization that you're a part of for being willing to do that. Um, before we dive into a couple quick shout outs, Man, we were just on the border uh, all last week with, um, we were out there with TMPA, the Texas Municipal oh. Police Association, Texas DPS, uh, National Border Patrol Council, a bunch of sheriffs, a bunch of local police chiefs. I got to pray with the Austin police chief, um, who's super cool, man. The interim chief, she's an amazing, amazing person. And I just want to give a shout out to our friends over at Warrior 12 for making this Texas Strong shirt. Um, absolutely love the, the servant hearts of the men and women who are serving out there every single day because they are really sort of the last um, front line, right? Like they are holding that line and doing everything in their power and they have become so politicized, right? And that it's all they wanna do is keep America safe. They wanna do their jobs. And so we need to give them all the love and support in the world. So Texas Strongman, Warrior 12 shout out to, to sending that shirt. So let's dive in. Yeah. Oh, We'll do the Pete. Yeah, do it, man. So, um, <laughs> funny, uh, another friend of mine, Pete Kennedy, he's a retired trooper as well as Troy. They work together. And he started a company called Allstate Flagging. And um, I told him, hey, I'll plug you. And he sends me, said, send me your bio. And, and I get, you know, like two pages. Hey, we're going to charge you like 80 bucks a word, dude. This isn't a bio. This isn't a two line bio. This is a freaking novel, bro. Where are you? I'm sending him a bill. Go ahead. So, ba <laughs> so basically, uh, Allstate Flagging is a limited liability company out of Massachusetts, and they hire um, the range of individuals. I'm just going to highlight some of this. Former auxiliary reserve officers, firefighters, retirees, veterans, students, and other. You do flag work in your communities that police officers aren't available to keep protecting our 
our utility workers. Um, if you're interested in a job, please call Pete. Um, you can reach out to him at pkennedy at allstateflagging.com. Outstanding human being. I, I reached out to him and asked if he would like me to plug his company because I think he's a great guy. So Pete, there it is, brother. Pete, that'll be a $500 donation to the Wounded Officer Retreat Center for that 8,000 word. Like, yeah, that was the Cliff Notes version. Well, he you, said he said his partner wrote it. Uh, I don't know his partner, but it, it's very eloquently written. Let but me see that. Let it's just that. too long. <laughs> He go. is the best looking man that has ever <laughs> graced the state of Massachusetts with his presence. He is a stuck. Okay. You know this dude too. Pete, I think Pete's partner also wrote War and Peace by the look of it. So. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, man, let's dive into your backstory. All right. Well, where do you want to start? I can start from the very beginning. Let's not go and, with conception. Well, uh, no, really that, that would be a ways back. And, and of course, this is where we came into contact. So, I always knew uh, from a young age, like so many kids, right? So what do you want to be? I want to be a cowboy. I want to be a fireman. I knew I wanted to be a, a Connecticut state trooper. My, my mother's brother was a state trooper. Uh, I, I grew up watching that, and I thought that would be the greatest job in the world. But how do I get from where I am, a kid from a small town, to an agency when I applied back in 1992, there were 11,800 people that applied for 80 positions, and it was very, very competitive. So how do I get to that over those hurdles along the way? So what I did was, uh, I, was all, I started in the military police, in the army, and I also was going to, I was, well, initially I wasn't going to school. I started working as a security officer in a hospital, and that's where you and I met many, many, many years ago. You were, you were a new cop, and I was a kid who wanted a part of it. So um, I would ask all the officers that would come in, Manchester Police, East Hartford, State Police, everybody that came in, I'd ask them, if I can have a minute of your time, how did you do it? How, what did you do to prepare? How did you get on this job? And they, most of them, I won't we'll say all, but most of them took some time. And they said, well, some said I went to college. Some said uh, you're doing what you should be doing right here. Some said I went in the military, I went in the fire department, whatever it was. I did all of what they said, except the fire department thing. I'm terrible at making chili and sliding down poles. But I, I decided I'm going to follow their advice because they can't be wrong because they're already there. So I, I went to college. I got a degree in criminal justice. I ended up, uh, some even said corrections. I did uh, work for the Connecticut Department of Corrections for 10 months. By the way, I, I give folks that work in corrections and detention uh, all the respect in the world. That is, it's a thankless job. Um, the, the things that would bother you most about that job are the things you probably wouldn't identify with if you haven't done that job, because it's not just a door that closes behind you and you're doing a 20 or 25 year bid eight hours at a time. It's not that. It's the sounds and the smells. They're overwhelming in those facilities. And I worked in an inner city jail in Hartford. So it was a good, it was a good lesson, a good indoctrination into understanding a different side of the world, right? Uh, I was fortunate to get hired on a local police department where I served three years. And the state police ended up hiring me and it was you know, the greatest 26 years that anybody could have. In fact, I enjoyed the state police so much, I retired from there twice. I retired once after 24 years, my last 10 as the, uh, we called it the behavioral health coordinator for the state, but I was the, the STOPS program, which is state troopers offering peer support. It's a program that I created, um, that I sort of developed and implemented. And let's, let's, let's be honest, you developed and implemented it. I did. I did. It was. I, I did that. Look, if second. you get humble with me, I'm going to tell the well, truth. So let's go with it. It, it was a program that gained international recognition, certainly after Sandy Hook. Um, it, a really amazing program. I will tell you that it's not just me saying this. It's anybody in the state police. It has saved lives over the years. And to me, helping the helper is, has always been. I think the highest calling in law enforcement to be able to help the people that are helping the community. And we know that when our officers are safe and when they're well, our communities are safe and well. So you have to take care of your own. And what I saw in the state police uh, after a couple of very noteworthy, uh, media worthy events that happened in Connecticut was that we weren't necessarily doing our due diligence to take care of our people as well as we could. We did have an employee assistance program at the time, but it was an external EAP. And quite frankly, EAP, I think at that time, was viewed as a four-letter word. Um, there was certainly stigma, a lot more stigma back then, uh, getting in the way. That's the obstacle. Stigma is the obstacle to getting help, right? And a lot of dinosaurs who are on this job, they would sort of frown upon Cops getting help, you know, rub a little bit of dirt on it and get back in the game. That was sort of the philosophy. And unfortunately, dinosaurs lay eggs, and I think we know that too. 
So um, I think a lot of those old timers are transitioning out. And I think police administrators now recognize that, that you need to take care of your officers. You need to take, because when you're, when you're taking care of your cops, liability goes down, right? You're not getting as many complaints. You're not having as many sick issues. You're not having the community uh, complaining about your officers. You gotta take care of them. So we created a wonderful program and really pro proliferated it over time. It started initially uh, as a, it was a letter that I wrote. Uh, it was a letter that I had in my head. I just kind of had an idea that I wanted to, I, I knew that our agency needed more than just an EAP that people weren't going to. So I wrote this letter, uh, it's a very long story, but once I wrote the letter, I was kind of told at the time, you probably shouldn't have done that. It was right after one of our uh, troopers who happened to be a partner of mine um, for a period of time. He had, uh, he had killed uh, a girl that I had introduced him to and then killed himself. And then, so it was the very next day and I was out at that scene all night. It was the very next day I sat at my desk and I said, you know, we know too much to get it wrong here. There are other agencies around this country that are doing something. And while they might not be doing everything, they're doing something, we need more. So I wrote a letter to the, to the uh, colonel of the state police, to the commissioner of the state police and the state police union. And I said, what, what can we do? Like, I think, I'm not just gonna tell you what we've done right and what we could do better, but I'm gonna give you some suggestions. So it was about a four page letter um, and it really talked about having peer support, military support, critical incident stress management, family support initiatives, different things that we just weren't doing. It was tons of gaps. So I wrote the letter, I sent it off, and about a year later, uh, the lieutenant governor at the time in Connecticut, somehow it got to him. He shared it with his significant other who was a, uh, a clinician, as I understand it, who said, this is really great. This is what Connecticut needs. It went to the General Assembly and they passed a public act that said that the Connecticut State Police will have some money to put together a peer support program. So we worked on that. We had a, a collective of folks that were on a steering committee, amazing folks, senior administrators in the State Police, folks from Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, rank and file people, union people. And we all looked at best practice programs around the country. What are other agencies doing? Uh, Pennsylvania State Police MAP program, member assistance program, outstanding. We looked at LA, we looked at PAPA in New York City, we looked at Chicago. Major organizations that had really done a lot of good legwork. So we took from their programs what we thought might work and sort of just catered them to our needs. About a year of that work before we went live with the program, we started with zero peer support people and we, by the time I retired, we had 77 peer support people. Uh, we had two critical incident stress management teams, a very thriving military support program, working with Beyond the Yellow Ribbon and a lot of different organizations. <clears throat> we did some great stuff, really did. I retired, took a job working at the Connecticut State Police Union as a litigation and legislative liaison. Um, saw the program sort of losing trajectory, let's just say, right? So the program that at one point, and we're talking about, I kept very, very, uh, very good data, right? The data was important to me. So when you look over the 10 year period that we ran that program, we had 13,000 new and ongoing contacts. That means 13,000 times that program was accessed with zero breaches and zero alleged breaches in confidentiality. Unfortunately, after I retired, that data tracking system sort of wasn't kept up with and they lost a lot of really good data. But that data wasn't just enough to say, this is really great that we're not violating confidentiality. What that data showed was trends. So if we saw upticks in different things, very similar to what I do now in Washington, DC, when we saw that data, we could cater programs to respond to that data, whether that was through in-service training, whether that was through uh, training for my personnel, whether it was training through our, our chaplains, right? We, we could change what we were doing based on what we saw. At some point, the Colonel and the Commissioner asked me if I would come back to the State Police, come out of retirement, be the Director of Trooper Wellness and Resilience. Who comes out of retirement, really? You, know, you should be fortunate that you made it through your career, but uh, I love that department more than any department in this world, and it means the world to me, the people, the men and women that wear that uniform. And I said, of course, I'll come back. It'd be an honor, and I did. And uh, I did it for a while, but right after I came back, COVID happened, uh, you know, the summer of love, if you will. You know, there were a whole lot of things that were going on that, uh, that really changed what, I, what my duties were to be. So as I was coming in to implement a wellness program, not just for troopers, for all six different divisions and civilians, as I was implementing my programs, it really had to change a little bit. It changed a little bit. Fast forward a year and a half later, I get an opportunity to do this on a national level. 
And as much as it was difficult for me to leave the agency that I enjoyed so much, knowing that we hadn't fully developed that program that I had wanted to, it was a great opportunity to do this for officers nationally. So that's what I do now in Washington, D.C., as the executive director uh, of Officer Safety and Wellness for the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund. It's, uh, we have some terrific programs, and I'd love to talk about them if you're interested. But 100%. So first, I want to uh, I got to give a back, big, big, big shout out to the new CEO, of the National Law Enforcement. I, I mean, Bill is absolutely incredible. He is a cop's cop. Um, just he's got a, a servant's heart and the work that he is doing to take this incredible organization to even the next level. I think it's awesome. I just absolutely love the man. Um, have you ever heard of the, the theory or the concept of a parallel universe? I have. So for, for people who are watching who have never heard of it, the idea is that for every decision we make, there's a, a rift in the time-space continuum and there's a whole new universe that's created and there's another version, everything's the exact same except you made the opposite decision. And so the idea is that there are you know, countless different universes out there in which every time you make a decision, it splits off into a new Now, I don't personally believe in this concept. I don't think many people do. But what is um, relevant here, and the reason I bring it up, is because the work that you do you will never, like, we can show what happens when you don't do that work. We can show the suicides. We can show um, the, the uh, domestic violence problems that we have. We could show the alcoholism rates. We can show all the problems. But what we can't quantify or qualify is when you do have programs like this that have been implemented, the number of lives that have been saved, the number of tragedies that have been stopped, the number of homes that haven't been lost, the number of marriages that have been kept together. We unfortunately can't trace or track that because you've stopped those things from happening, but we'll never even know those stories. And that's what I think is so incredible about the work that you've done historically and the work that you're doing now is that we will never, maybe you know, one day when we're up with the big man upstairs, he'll open up our eyes and say, hey, you saved that guy's life. You you saved that family, you kept that home, um, but we will never know the impact. And, and that's why I think that the work that, that guys like you do is so incredibly powerful because you it is truly a thankless position. And I wanna say thank you, man, because I've heard the stories. I've heard guys who have been pulled back from the edge because of this, and you should be super proud of that. Sorry, I didn't mean to just like hijack this, but. No, that's okay. I know you wanted to ask them about the programs, right? I always do. <laughs> Uh, Touche. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, to, to further that, we, you know, we crossed paths in St. Troy for a couple of years, and um, we had an officer suicide in uh, East Hartford, Connecticut, right in the PD, and uh, our team got called in, and I'm walking in and, you know, kind of running in, hugging a couple people and stuff, and out, out comes Mr. Smooth. I'm like, ah, oh, beautiful, <laughs> you know. Um, Is that Buchanan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, in seeing that, you, you know, as, as we talked about on the other show, you can't stop what's going to happen. But you can be someone who makes a change in where we go from there. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and I remember that day very vividly. One guy literally running into the locker room and, and, and literally falling on to my knees because he is hysterically crying over the loss of his, his love coworker. You know, and then talking to Troy for quite a while and, you know, exchanging phone numbers and, and knowing, walking away from him, that the work he was doing and the work I was doing had a lot of value. We never had to check in on each other because we knew, like, what we were doing was going to make a difference. We can't change the incident. And I think with Critical Incident, again, it, we come after. But my thing was always, how do you come out of it? Do you leave feeling like you've left impact? Did you've helped people who are struggling now? Do you follow up with them? You know, you can give all the hugs you want that day, but if you don't follow up with them, then it's absolute bullshit. Well, here's what's crazy. So I was in Texas last week over in San Antonio with this guy, Robert Walker, who was like a total God thing, how we met, right? And I talked about how I feel like the one, the, the greatest gift that I've been given from a, a skills perspective, right? It's not something I have, but it's the ability to bring people together. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, man, sometimes I kind of feel like, like God's creating this like fence, right? By crossing paths. And he said, no, man, it's more like a net. Like we're all running in our own path, but then other people are running in these paths and we make this big net. And when we cast that net out, we're able to, to bring people into the family and to help them. So as you talk about that story, I think about having met Trish, mm -hmm. uh, which was his, uh, his wife um, and her son ended up working for us for a while. 
And we, you know, we have gone on to work with, with her through uh, the foundation that she runs right now. And we have met so many officers that they're, uh, I'm just saying right here in this room, I'm mm -hmm. seeing that net that's been created mm -hmm. to try and help guys. And I know that his horrific story and the fact that he asked for help and he didn't get it. And then he wrote a, his, in his suicide so, note, yep. he said, make this into something that helps people yep. make my loss into something and i know that as, as tragic as that was his story and her taking the ball and running with it and men like you who are taking the ball and running with it saying we're going to make something of this has saved lives don't know how many lives but we know without question it has saved lives mm -hmm. so you just totally reinforced my point talk about some of the programs that you're doing now man well i mean where do we start so just to talk about sort of the fund in general, right? When you look at the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund, a lot of folks don't realize it's really broken down into three pillars or divisions, like law enforcement people may call them divisions. Everybody knows about the memorial. I don't think that there's a law enforcement officer who's worn a badge that is not familiar with the National Law Enforcement Officer Memorial. People who aren't cops, it's a wall, right? With the names yeah. of the fallen officers who are engraved on it in DC. It, it, and there's really a campus. There's a physical campus in D.C. on East Street Northwest. So on one side of the, of the street is the memorial itself uh, in a reflecting pool. And on the other side is the uh, National Law Enforcement Muse Museum. So we honor the fallen on one side of the street. And then on the other side of the street, we tell the story of American law enforcement in an honorable way. And that's the way it has to be told because it's an honorable profession. So when you go in there, whether you're an, if you're a law enforcement officer, you're going to leave there feeling appreciated. If you're not a law enforcement officer, you're going to want to sign up to be one. And that's the way it should be when you go through there. Um, so many amazing exhibits. I mean, I, I've been working there now for three years, almost three years. And every time I go through that museum, I always pick up a different nugget. I always pick up something, something new and special. And it's a wonderful place. And then the last pillar is the pillar that I oversee, which is our officer safety and wellness programs. So we have a number of programs. And the first one I'll talk about is traffic safety programs. So we partner, partner through a cooperative agreement with NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, where we execute deliverables. So we are looking at the fatality data coming from our research team, right? Because we are the, we are the organization that certifies line of duty death. You got to go through a names committee. It's a, it's a very robust experience before your name goes on that wall. It's a, almost a vetting process, if you will. So they capture a tremendous amount of data. We look at the traffic data, and then we see what that data is telling us. And then based on that data, of course, we report that data to NHTSA, and then we come up with programs based on that data to try to save lives. What we do in officer safety and wellness is twofold. Number one, making it safer for those who serve. Number two, keeping names off the memorial wall. That's my, char my charge every day when I get up. That's what I have to do. So we look at that data, and we see these emerging trends. So for example, last, last year, we saw a lot of struck by fatalities where 19 officers in one year got hit and killed outside of their car, directing traffic at a traffic stop. The, the numbers just jumped up. So as we were looking at that, we're saying, why is this happening? And we don't necessarily have all the answers as an individual organization. But what we can do is bring the greatest minds from around the country all together in Washington, D.C., which we did. And we had a national traffic safety summit where we brought in everybody from Gordon Graham. I mean, you name it, really some incredibly bright people. We brought them all in. And, and put together not only a panel, but a great opportunity for people to get up and talk about safety. We showed some, some really terrific uh, technologies to keep people safe. And then of course, at the end, it's not just enough that we live stream this and invite people to our, uh, our facility and put it on YouTube, but even more importantly, is we have to kind of take that eight hour program and distill it down into a white paper, if you will, a report. So we distill it down, we, we produce that, we publish it, and of course, it's available on our website nleomf.org. If you want to go on there, we've done it for traffic safety. We've done it for firearm safety. But just to get back to our programs, moving on from there, we have Safe Leo. So that is where a subawardee from IIR, the Institute for Intergovernmental Research, that's a BJA program. We are, we execute, we have trainers that go around the country. By the way, you may be interested in joining our team. If so, SMEs, we have subject matter experts that go around the country and train law enforcement organizations. Safe LEO stands for Suicide Awareness for Law Enforcement. We, it's not enough just to talk about suicide. It's just not enough to have a policy. It's, what you need to do is have everybody in your agency from the top down 
not only recognize what suicide is, the suicidality, you have to see these indicators, but what do we do with it? And not be afraid to have those courageous conversations with somebody, because how many times we work with somebody, they've said or done something that just seems a little bit off, really out of character for them. What are we doing with that? Are we afraid to sideline your career? Because I know if I go to my supervisor or the chief or the colonel and say, I think there might be something wrong here, that you're going to be put on the rubber gun squad and that you're not gonna have access to the overtime opportunities, right? These are all the things that we hear. But you have to have those conversations because those conversations save lives. And that's really what we want officers around the nation to know. Listen, we're giving you permission to do the right thing. If these things happen, and then the other thing is pre-incident education. Think about the way the academy was when you or I went through many, many years ago. It's totally different. When I went through the State Police Academy, we learned about motor vehicle law and criminal law and shine our boots and make a really nice bed and I could probably run further than, well, maybe as far as I could when I was in boot camp. But the point was, you could, we really knew those things, but what was the discussion about mental health? What was the discussion about the universal and predictable signs and symptoms of post-traumatic stress? And the answer was none. We didn't talk about it at all. People didn't talk about that. I have been in roll calls where I am overhearing two state troopers at the end of the table before I br begin a presentation talking about how one of them is going through marriage and family therapy with their wife. That's today. Do you think that that was happening 30 years ago? Of course not. Of course not. People would have, you've got to keep it to yourself. You've got to suck it in, right? So suicide awareness for law enforcement, outstanding programs. Then we have our flagship program, which is Destination Zero. Destination Zero is, it's an awards program to some degree, but what this does is, and we were talking about Texas DPS. They just, they had sent in an application. What this is, a program where you submit your best practice programs, your agency submits, right? And it's in five different categories. Two have to do with safety, and the rest have to do with wellness and resilience. So you submit a, 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 your program. We help you build that submission to the best that it is, stats, photos, whatever you can do to make it great. So we have more than 400 resource programs on, that you can go look at. Here's the great part. For an agency that doesn't have, let's say, a peer support program currently, and they, wanna, they, they just don't know where to start, you can go on our website, you can go under our resource library and find hundreds of contacts, hundreds of resources, and you can see the way the programs are laid out. So we're, this is a way for us to bring programs together, but it's a better way for us to find the best programs and then shine a spotlight on that, really highlight the great work that they're doing. So agencies around the country who are looking at what are the best programs, what can we do best for our people, they have an immediate place that they can go to. Look at our Destination Zero resource library, and you can go through and there's keyword searches. So it doesn't matter what you're trying to come up with. Maybe you want to come up with a traffic safety program, whatever it might be. You can find policies in there. There's a ton of resources. So that's really, it's a twofold great thing. It's great for the men and women who are out there doing the job because them, they and their agencies can get this information. And of course, we can really um, give accolades to the departments that are really surfacing to do great work. And the one that you left out is uh, Police Week and the Vigil. At it, it, Police Week itself is, is an amazing undertaking. Uh, the Vigil, for anybody who's never been to the Vigil, and uh, I was fortunate last year I got to read names of the Vigil, which for me, has, I think, has probably been my highest honor in law enforcement, to be able to sit on that stage. And you can't put into words the emotion when you look out at the sea of those candles and you see 40, 45, 50,000 people standing out there, all very collectively, um, honoring folks that gave their last measure of life in, in uh, defense and protection of our nation. I mean, to me, uh, to see that from being up on that stage, and um, it, it was more than moving. It was more than moving. But uh, Police Week is, is of course, it's, there's a, a bunch of activities. And if you go to our website, the calendar is already starting to, to fill up. So it's not just, of course, the vigil or the wreath laying ceremony or stand watch for the fallen. There are activities going on both at the memorial, inside of our museum, and all around DC. COPS does a number of things, a Fraternal Order of Police does a number of things. So, and, and many of those we cross over on, we work together. So go on our web, website, we certainly put their events on there too, so you can take a look, see what's happening. Uh, I'll be there for the week, if you wanna say hi, uh, certainly come find me, I will not be reading names this year, so. Uh, I think I got your place. I think you did, and congratulations to it. Man, it was uh, when Bill asked me, when, when we went out to dinner, I almost cried. I mean, it was such a, a touching, I mean, 
can't even put it into words. I've been on the flip side of it. We've we've attended many times. We filmed it, and just sitting there is so overwhelming. Wait until you're on the stage. I'll talk to you afterward and see what you're feeling. Oh, no, dude, I'm crashing in your hotel room. I'm all right, sleeping, man. Yeah, I'll yeah. sleep on the, I, you'll have a nice pull-out couch, and I'll have a nice bed. It'll be great. <laughs> Brother, shameless plug time for the organization. I got, listen, I would love to do all the plugs. I'm gonna, I, I could plug all day. Here is the key. All that you need to know is if you go on nleomf.org, take a look at our officer safety and wellness programs. Take a look at what other organizations are doing and take a look at what we are doing to try to assist you to be well because wellness is a holistic approach. I mean, we, we, we talk about chaplaincy, of course. I mean, I, I could talk about that for days. That is just one small component. Yet, if you go on our website, you can find them. Tremendous amount of resource information. I think a lot of organizations are recognizing that you need to have a chaplaincy component. But it's about, it's about understanding peer support and what the roles are. It's about understanding what critical incident stress management is. It's about taking care of yourselves because nobody should be walking wounded. None of our officers, when you came into this job at 21 or 25 and you were predictably in your best mental, physical, spiritual health, right? You just came through an academy. You were vetted before you went in. You were tested along the way. You get through your FTO program. You're out on your own. How is it that at the end of your career, or even for some people halfway through their career, they're almost unrecognizable? Right? How is it that mentally, psychologically, spiritually, physically, they don't even resemble who the person was that just came in? So what happened along the way? And I think that there are a number of variables and a number of factors. But the key is this, you got to take care of yourself. And I will tell you one thing that I have, and I've been to more critical incidents than uh, I could even recall. It's not your trauma that day. Officers that are going to a fatal accident, that are going to a SIDS death, that are going to a hanging, that are seeing a child go through a wood chipper, that is not your trauma that day. Your, your day is going to come. We all have it. You have a loss in the family. You go through a, a divorce. They all come. But if you go through your career collecting and compartmentalizing all of these traumas that other people are experiencing, you see the horrors of life. You can't carry that for 20 or 30 years. And even if you are able to, I want you to live to be 150 years old. I want, I want that, that, those retirement checks that you're getting from the state or municipality or the county, I want them to be covered in tears because they can't believe that you've lived to be 125 years old. Why is this person still here? You want to live well, but that's not something that you just decide to kick in. But here's the thing, if you've waited your whole life, if you're a retiree at the end of your career, it's never too late to start. But that's the reason why we're trying to get to these guys and gals while they're in the academy. Get to them early. Let them understand. Let their families understand. Talk to their families about, hey, listen, you know your significant other better than anybody. If they go to a bad call and you start to see these signs, this is what you need to do, right? And that's, I don't think it's done enough, and I don't think we can do it enough, but I think we need to start doing it. And we're doing great work. I know there's great work being done. Let's have some more of it. Website one more time. NLEOMF.org. Parting thoughts? Awesome to see you again, brother, and thank you for what you continue to do. Pleasure's mine, my friend. Absolutely. Love you, man. Thanks for coming thank out. Thank you both. Guys, that. thank you all for watching. Thanks for hitting that share button. God bless you all. God bless America. And what's up, Bernie's mom? God bless your mom.